So we just finished talking about reuptake and leftover neurotransmitters. Let's get a little more specific about these neurotransmitters and how they contribute and work in the neural firing communication piece. So the very last thing on your notes is this chart. And yes, you need to know every single one of these, the neurotransmitter name, how to pronounce them and spell them, but also their role and the associated disorder. Okay, so each of these neurotransmitters, super important um, to how, and they naturally exist in us, right? So the first one is called acetylcholine. Okay, a lot of times you'll see this abbreviated as ACH. It's acetylcholine. Its primary roles involve learning and memory, but also muscle contractions. Its associated disorder is Alzheimer's disorder. Okay, so again, muscle contraction, and you would have a lack of acetylcholine. You should write that down for associated disorders. You would have a lack of acetylcholine with Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is the next one. It contributes or its primary roles include movement, thought processes, but the big one is rewarding sensations. Every time you eat your favorite meal, you get a rush of dopamine and it just makes you oh, feel so good and rewarding. Therefore, you are going to eat that favorite meal again because you got a rush of dopamine. Associated disorders include Parkinson's disease. You would have a lack of dopamine, too little dopamine with Parkinson's disease. Also schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is an increase or overabundance of dopamine, but there's also um, a lot of involvement of dopamine with drug addiction because of that re the rewarding sensations, right? If, if, they, if you get a rush of dopamine after you do something, it makes you feel good, you're gonna wanna do it again, and that becomes a very hard habit to break. Serotonin. Primary roles involve emotional states as well as sleep, and associated disorders would be depression, and that someone would have a low level, abnormally low level, or decrease in serotonin. Norepinephrine is the next one. It's um, involved in physical arousal, learning, and memory. Associated disorders include depression as well as stress. Okay, so you would have lowered levels in a depressed state, and you could say an increased, increased levels of norepinephrine in a stressful state. GABA, which has a very long drawn out name, that's the acronym for the neurotransmitter. Its primary role is the inhibition of brain activity. Um, associated disorders include anxiety disorders. So whether that be generalized anxiety disorder or even um, panic disorder or phobias. Endorphins. Endorphins help with pain perception. In fact, they are your naturally existing pain killers and they help you to tolerate pain. So if you break your leg or are in significant amount of pain, you will get a rush of endorphins that will keep you conscious and able to tolerate the pain a little bit better. But also um, with positive emotions, a happier state. Um, associated disorders would be opiate addiction in that heroin and things like morphine, um, the medication that you get in anesthetics for surgery and other things, um, they mimic endorphins. So neurotransmitters, some more on how they work, not necessarily the specific ones. What they do is they bind to the receptors, right, almost like a little doorway. They bind to the receptors of the receiving neuron in a key lock mechanism in that the same way that your key fits into your door and unlocks it, a neurotransmitter is like a key that fits into a receptor site perfectly and unlocks it to send the message, okay? So each neurotransmitter has a unique chemical configuration that is incredibly complicated that we don't need to know about. We just need to know that it exists. And neurotransmitters attach to specific receptors. It's like a puzzle piece fitting into its proper place. The receptors will only accept or recognize one type of neurotransmitter. And this image kind of lets you see what that's like. This yeah, or like orangish reddish part down here is the receptor site on the receiving neuron, whereas the blue part is the neurotransmitter molecule, um, and it fits perfectly that then allows the dendrites, right, to send the message on the next neuron. Let's talk about agonists and antagonists. Before we talk about their difference, we need to talk about how they are similar, and you should write this in your notes and make sure it is engraved in your brain. Agonists and antagonists are externally existing 
substances in our environment, okay? Neurotransmitters naturally exist in the neural communication of our bodies. They are naturally there. Agonists and antagonists come from the environment, okay? And they actually, you should also write this down, they, if they are able to break the blood-brain barrier of our brain, right, then they are able to have a neural um, impact and therefore impact our behavior and our brain functioning, okay? So our brain has what's called a blood-brain variable, or a blood-brain barrier in that the blood vessels surrounding our brain are super, super, super thin as compared to the rest of our body. So that molecules that we don't want to get in there don't get in there. However, psychoactive drugs get in there. They're small enough. Psychoactive drugs as well as some other things that you wouldn't consider drugs, but they do exist in the environment because we've consumed them. They're either agonists or antagonists. So an agonist, a substance that would mimic a neurotransmitter's activity, so it is similar enough in structure chemically, right, the molecule itself, that it mimics the neurotransmitter's effect on the receiving neuron. So often anti or I'm sorry, often agonists increase activity by inhibiting reuptake. This is huge. Let me give you an example. Um, heroin is the best example I can think of. Um, it fits into the receptor sites of endorphins. So it's an agonist for endorphins. But what it will also do is go back up to the receiving or um, sending neuron and it will block reuptake. So all that extra heroin molecule is left in the synapse, they're not going to be reuptaken. They're going to send over and over and over and over and over again. Hence why a high on heroin is so unnatural and unsafe as compared to a natural quote high, it's not really a high, on endorphins. Um, it fits like a master key, right? So I have a certain key that fits in my door, but it also opens the other teacher's doors in the building because it's a master key, right? It doesn't fit perfectly, but it fits good enough. That's the way an agonist is. So an antagonist would block neurotransmitter activity. So it's similar enough to occupy the receptor site and block the action of the neurotransmitter that should be going there but it's not similar enough to stimulate activity, okay? It's like an other, a different key. So if I use my house key in my classroom door, it's an antagonist in that it won't let me in, right? But it won't let in my actual key that lets me in the door either. It's blocking that activity. So how do drugs influence neurotransmitter activity? We're gonna talk about this a whole lot more in unit four. Um, but the biggest thing being that they mimic the neurotransmitter and produce the same effect, um, but they can block the receptor sites in the receiving neuron and prevent the effect of neurotransmitters as well. So number one here would be the agonist. Number two would be the antagonist. And number three, drugs can block or inhibit the reuptake of neurotransmitters, increasing the effects of the neurotransmitter or chemical that you've consumed. And number three would be types of agonists. Let me give you a quick example with antagonists. Botulism, um, have you ever heard that you shouldn't eat from a can that you buy at Kroger or something that is dented? Well, you shouldn't. It's probably just because Joe, who you know puts the cans on the rack, dropped it on accident. But it could be because it's contaminated and there's botulism inside, which acts as a vacuum. If you were to consume botulism, it is an antagonist for acetylcholine. So it will block muscle contraction of your digestive tract and kill you very quickly. Botox is a form of botulism and people put that in their face to block muscle contraction so they avoid crow's feet and you know their 11 lines and all that stuff. So it's kind of complicated with this neurotransmitter activity and reuptake and agonist and antagonist. Please rewind if you need to. Clarify it in your brain so that you can say out loud to someone what a neurotransmitter does and what an agonist and antagonist does.